We've all seen the pictures and read the stories in the history books about the kings and queens with their power and privilege and silks and furs. But in this series, I want to discover the other side of history. I'm already quite nervous. The side we don't often hear about. How ordinary British people lived their lives. From the Tudors, you'll see why it did attract my attention. <laughs> Disgusting. To the Victorians. Throw a stone in Victorian London, you will hit a drunken cabman. Is, is, is that many of them? We are not amused. From the Georgians. You take the saw. Oh, my God. It's you horrible don't... just seeing you do that. Oh. To the people who really fought the Second World War. James could hear the ping of bullets and the clatter of shrapnel. One thing's for sure, these people knew the meaning of the word tough. I'll be finding the truth about their daily lives. What they ate, how long would that have lasted? Up to three years. How they made a living. There's even value in a rat when it's dead. And those vital necessities of life. What did you do if you wanted to pee? Go in the bucket. The bucket? This is British history from the bottom up. You've got to admit, I am terrifying. <laughs> <laughs>The Nazis were the most terrifying enemies in one of the nastiest wars in history. But taking them on wasn't just down to men like him. Britain fought the Second World War with a bunch of ordinary office workers, grocers, bakers and housewives. We know the result, but what was it really like for ordinary Britons caught up in it all? Most of the people who still remember the Second World War were only children at the time, but even though they were just kids, a lot of them still have vivid memories of having to seek shelter because their country was under brutal attack. In 1940, eight-year-old Babs Clark and her family found themselves in the thick of it all in London's East End. So what did Babs's mum do? She grabbed the kids and headed for the countryside. Thousands of parents had the same idea. Nearly a million schoolchildren were packed off to the country. Babs and her mum and sister Jean ended up in Torquay. It was amazing. They had a small cottage on a farm and went to a local school. Best of all, they could play on the beach every day, safe from the bombs. Or so they thought. Babs, now in her 80s, still remembers one particular incident like it was yesterday. There was a couple of planes coming in from the sea. And I was saying to my sister, I wonder what they are, Jean. And it was two Messerschmitts. No machine gun the beach we were on. Cos we came home full of it, telling my mum, and I won't say the actual words my mum said, but in other words, it was so-and-so that for a game of soldiers, we're going back to London, I'd rather the bombs coming down than the bloody Germans machine gunning my kids. <laughs> Babs and her mum and sister hot-footed it back to the family home in Bethnal Green. Which was yours? This one. So um, when you got back to London, what was your house like? It was all right, apart from the fact we had to have a tarpaulin over the roof. Because the roof had got blown off during the Blitz. And you still live there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course you did. The family's unscheduled break in Torquay may well have saved their lives. And after Hitler had had his way with the East End, it was even more fun than the beach. If, well, a little dangerous. 
more of a problem for growing kids was food. The government was keen to make sure nothing got wasted. To make sure Britain didn't run out, the amount of food everybody could eat was rationed. And every time you wanted to buy something, you got a stamp in this, your ration book. For Bab's mum, it was a right old drag. Stuff this for a game of soldiers. And provided for only a limited menu. This is what Babs would have been allowed in her rations. A couple of pints of milk, some sugar, a little bit of cheese, some jam, some marge, some lard, one egg and some egg powder, this much meat and a few sweets. It would make a lovely meal, wouldn't it? But it had to last Babs a whole week. The government was full of useful advice on how to make everything go further. But there was one thing that wasn't in short supply for Babs and her family, greens. We hate spinach. We had our allotment and we grew a lot of veg and our allotment was in there. My dad used to be quite proud of that allotment, what things he grew. <laughs> yeah. What did your mum make you? Stew. We used to have a lot of stews. After tea, as night fell, Babs and her mum and sister would head down to the newly built Bethnal Green tube station. EastEnders depended on the underground as the best place to hide from Hitler's bombs. My mum got a bunk down here for a us. A bunk? Yeah, it was a three-tier bunk, bottom, middle and top. There was loads of space because the rails hadn't yet been laid in the new station. But it's surprising the bunks didn't collapse. They'd been assembled by Boy Scouts from a flat pack. How far down that tunnel did you used to sleep? I wouldn't like to say how many yards, but it was a good 10, 15 minute walk. It was quite a way down. And you didn't feel claustrophobic? No, no. I mean, you had the bunks either side and the walkway in the middle, and I think it's because we knew so many people. My mum had stopped and talked to them, and you got to your bunk in the end. What did you do if you wanted to pee? Go in the bucket. The bucket? Yeah, they had buckets. Very so far along. Yeah. With the curtain round it. Very smelly. Oh. Apart from the smell, it all sounds rather jolly. It was like an underground town, with a library, doctor's surgery... Say ah. ..and a hall for weddings or parties. Every time a soldier came home, they had a jolly shindig. Did you feel safe here? Yeah. But then again, you see, I had my mum and my sister, so I felt safe, cos I was with them. I wonder if you left anything down there. It's chewing gum. I <laughs> stuck so. it on one of the walls. Could still be there, could it? I reckon it? it still is there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the fun was about to come to a juddering halt as once again the realities of war hit home. On the 3rd of March 1943, an incident took place at Bethnal Green, which in moments became a major tragedy. It was a rainy night, the air raid siren went off at 8.17. People started coming down into the tube as they always did. But at that moment, anti-aircraft guns began to start firing in Victoria Park, just over the road there. So more and more people came down. And it was very dark, they only got one light because of the blackout. And there weren't handrails here then like there are now. And all the steps were really slippy. And a woman tripped over with her son and some old chap fell on top of them. And more and more people kept pressing down until they were right up to the ceiling, crushing each other. Although Babs survived, many didn't. A memorial next to Bethnal Green tube station, erected surprisingly recently in 2017, marks the worst British civilian disaster in World War II. 173 people were crushed to death. What do you remember about that night? 
I know I got pushed and I fell over something and somebody fell on me. There were so many people down the stairs, they were all falling on top of me. And I just heard my sister saying, oh, don't pull me out yet, I've got my little sister here. And with that, whoever it was pulled the pair of us out. Didn't know what had happened to my mum. And my sister was going round asking if people had seen anything of her mum, which they hadn't. And then an air raid warden said to her, go in that room, she might be in there. Jean went in there and um, it was all dead bodies she had to look at to see if her mum was there. Luckily, Bab's mum had survived. And the next day, life went on as usual. She still got us up the next morning for me to go to school. And the headmaster was in assembly and he said there's been a bad accident at Bethlehem Green Tube Station. And he said, any of you children that were in it, you can go home for the day. <laughs> well, after the school come home yeah. with us, they all marched out. Did you ever use that shelter again or was it closed down? Oh, no, we used it the following night. Babs and her family just kept calm and carried on. The German bombing campaign deliberately set out to undermine our morale. But talking to Babs, I get a real sense of the conviction and determination that was shared by almost everyone. And I reckon it was that, as much as anything, that got us through. Many, though, faced a different kind of danger. Hundreds of thousands of ordinary young men were learning how to fight and to kill. James Palmer was one of them. James Palmer lived in Hume, Manchester with his dad. He was very larky, very jokey as a lad. Oh, by heck, do you think they're impressed? I should flip him well up, so. Very good. What's next? By 1939, he was working as an office boy in the garage. He spent a lot of time with his girlfriend, Muriel, and he was just about to turn 21. James's birthday was on July the 1st, but it was a slightly glum affair. War was on the horizon, and young men between the ages of 20 and 22 were being recruited by the government to boost army numbers. James must have opened his birthday cards with mixed feelings. Especially as one of the cards wasn't a card at all. It was his call-up notice. Within two weeks, James was being seen off at the station by his girlfriend and his dad. James's parting from his father was emotional for both men. His dad had served in the First War and had seen the horrors of the battlefield firsthand. And when his wife had died, he devoted himself to looking after his son. And now, he was going to have to let him go. He must have been worried sick. He knew all about war. James wrote in his diary on the day he left. Muriel was in tears, clinging to my arm. Dad turned away as she kissed me. A lump in my throat prevented me from saying much. I was on my way to God knows where or what. Where James was actually headed was Warminster to join the 13th Tank Regiment. On his first day, James was presented with loads of stuff. I'm meeting Alex Jones, a war veteran and army historian, to find out more. So he would suddenly have been responsible for all this? Absolutely. As soon as they arrived, they'd have been given a kit bag in the QM stores, and, of course, if the army gives someone kit and equipment, you know there's going to be inspections coming up. He'd have had to have bolted his boots, he would have had to have pressed his kit, he would have had to have uh, blankoed the webbing as well, so given it this kind of nice green protective layer, which all the soldiers thought was utterly pointless. Don't say a word, absolute silence. So this is what his setup would have been like. He's not real, by the way, just in case you were wondering. He'd have had a cupboard like this with all his stuff in it and his uniforms laid out, and he'd have had a regulation blanket. 
Everything ship shape, all out there for the world to see. But amidst all this boysy jollity, James met the corporal in charge. <laughs> Jock, a regular soldier. On the first night, the lights go out, darkness, you're supposed to go to sleep, but some of the recruits keep on talking and Jock tells them to shut up, but they don't. In fact, they're talking even louder and Jock goes, when I tell you to do something, you do it! And it goes completely silent and then one of the recruits says, get stuffed and then all hell breaks loose. Jock grabs him and punches him straight in the face and knocks him out cold. Welcome to the war, James. But it wasn't only this mouthy private who got a rude shock from army life. James and the new soldiers like him were complete fishes out of water, weren't they? They really were, because they didn't have any prior military training. Maybe the only experience they had were the stories maybe from their fathers. We know James's father was a veteran of the Somme, for example. Yeah. What would his training have been? Well, James, when he first turned up, would have undertaken eight weeks of basic military training. <laughs> It also would have consisted of anti-gas training. Uh, the army was very concerned about the gas threat. Behind you, there is a pretty fearsome-looking instrument. Presumably, he would have been trained on that. Yes, this is the, the Vickers machine gun, which would have been the standard armament in a lot of British light tanks at the start of the war. James recounts when he first gets his chance to to shoot on a live range. Yeah. Uh, he's so excited, he just fires off all the rounds at once. He's going blam, 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 forever and ever. Well, no, because all he has, given the cuts uh, to training allowances, yeah. is 20 rounds to practice with. Which, at about 500 rounds a minute, meant that James would be out of ammo in... Ooh, about two seconds. Oh. Perhaps because of his enthusiasm, James was assigned to be a gunner on a tank. Then, in late May 1940, the call finally came. James was going to fight in France. He was given 48 hours leave, and then he was off. He spent his last day in Britain with his girlfriend Muriel and his father, before heading across the channel. When he landed, the German army was only a few miles away and his tank troop soon found itself under attack. As we topped the rise, anti-tank guns hit us from the right flank. Four of our tanks were ablaze before we'd gone 10 yards. We were sitting ducks. It was sheer murder. I saw some men running amongst the trees with their clothes burning like torches. Men were dragging their pals through the mud away from the burning tanks, and the smell of burning flesh was catching my throat. James crouched and he could hear the ping of bullets and the clatter of shrapnel, but his tank driver pressed on and on through the hailstorm of fire, and eventually he reached the other side of the valley. Their first action had been a disaster, though. Only four of the 25 lads in James's troop were still alive. Soon, his regiment was desperately retracing the path back to the coast as the army retreated via Dunkirk. They were off back to Blighty almost as soon as they'd left. James returned to Manchester and proposed to Muriel. She said yes, but now James had a war to win. He'd be in some of its most crucial battles before life would return to anything like normal and he and his new fiance could finally tie the knot. For many ordinary Brits, taking on Hitler's fearsome war machine demanded a brazen response and women especially, suddenly found themselves doing all sorts of things they'd never imagined doing. Women like Eileen Heron. In 1939, Eileen was 23, 
but she still lived at home because she worked for her family's grocery business in Folkestone, where she served behind the counter and drove the delivery van. Eileen was a bit of a pioneer. When she was only 20, she'd been among the first women to take the newly introduced driving test. Little did she know, though, what use her driving skills would be once the war started. Just three months into it, 43,000 women volunteered for the Auxiliary Territorial Service, or ATS, the Women's Infantry. And Eileen decided to do her bit and join them. The army welcomed her with an armful of jabs, just a scratch, from a needle already blunted by the other recruits. She shared a freezing Nissen hut with around 20 other women, but at least they could help each other take their medicine before settling down on a lumpy mattress. Oh, night-night. I wonder if Eileen regretted her decision as she sat in her freezing cold barracks. There was three feet of snow on the ground, and OK, the recruits were given a bucket of coal a day, but one bucket was hardly going to make any impact at all in a tin building. At the end of the first week, she trudged all the way to the nearest town for a hot bath at the swimming pool and a nice cup of cocoa. But getting used to unsumptuous living conditions was the easy bit. Eileen was in the army now, and there was a whole new world of pain to embrace. For the new recruits, training was intense and relentless. From the shrill sound of the bugle at 6am... The whole day was a long list of drills, physical exercises and skills training. And all for a measly 11 shillings a week. Two-thirds of what a man of the same rank would have got. But Eileen was special. She was a high-value recruit because she had something the army needed. She could drive a truck. So-called teletrucks were used as anything from ambulances to carriers of vital military equipment. And I'm having a go on one. The clutch and the accelerator and the braking is great, but... The steering... Oh, it oh, leaves a lot to be desired compared with today's cars. Every time I go around a corner, I, I feel it in my biceps. But these were brilliant vehicles. They were so adaptable, real dog's bodies vehicles. But the downside was that they were very bumpy and uncomfortable. I'm having a great time, but I'm only doing it for one morning. Eileen had to do it month after month. Poor old Eileen. She must have been knackered. In fact, she called it her wretched Tilly. That was a really good drive. It was nice and simple, you know. There's only sort of four or five little things to push and pull on it. But the Viz is not very good at all. It must have been very difficult at night. Absolutely, and especially because of the blackouts. Headlights would have been just a glimmer of light coming from that. And obviously, the threat of invasion was at its height, so uh, all of the signposts were being taken down. And so they'd have to rely on map reading and knowing where they were going. Juliet Pattinson is a historian of the ATS. She knows all about everyday life for women like Eileen. Well, they're in barracks, so they're going to be having mass catering, hearty, nutritious meals that could be feeding hundreds of people. They actually got better rations than the ordinary civilian. Um, but uh, So I think she would have been well-fed. And the rest of the time when she wasn't working? She worked long hours, but she would always have time off uh, and they would uh, go to the cinema, there would always be dances on a Saturday. Women were very much in demand at the local army barracks. So I think they played hard and worked hard. There's lots of nice accounts where women talk about wearing a bit of lipstick, wearing non-regulation underwear, because nobody's going to notice that they're not wearing their khaki uh, pants. Um, so there are opportunities for these women to individualise the muddy, green, grey, dull uniform. There was a slogan that beauty is a duty too. So you have these manufacturers, whether it's a toothpaste or breakfast cereal or shampoo, and it would be very much, you know, the woman in the ATS, like Eileen, who would be applying particular kind of face cream, for example. 
There was this expectation that women would pay attention to their appearance because actually it would have a knock-on effect on male morale. I bet if I said to you, beauty is a duty too now, you'd smack <laughs> me in the nose. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Eileen might not have enjoyed driving her Tilly very much, but she was obviously pretty good at it because soon she was made a driving instructor and was promoted to the rank of Lance Corporal. This meant she now had 25 trainees under her and a lot more responsibility. Under Eileen, hundreds of women learned to drive and maintain motorbikes, ambulances and trucks, helping the war effort to smash the Nazis. But she was about to experience something even more exciting. One day, Eileen was ordered to go to her commandant's office and he told her a secret. Apparently, a new subaltern, which was the equivalent of a second lieutenant, was going to be working alongside her and her friends. But this was no ordinary subaltern. Her name was Princess Elizabeth. Eileen and Princess Elizabeth were soon mending the tilly trucks together. By day, subaltern Elizabeth mucked in with the other girls, but at night, she turned back into a princess and went to sleep in her castle. Eileen wrote at the time that the princess was quite striking, pretty with lovely eyes and a charming smile. But more celebrities were about to appear. One day, King George VI and his wife turn up to have a look at exactly what it is their daughter, Princess Elizabeth, is doing. And it's, a, it's all pomp and circumstance, until suddenly King George leans under the bonnet, starts fiddling away with the engine. Lord knows what he's doing. One wonders what this bit does. Elizabeth's panicking. Everyone else is laughing. Then Elizabeth gets her hands out and goes, look, Dad, they're all oily. Everyone seems to have seen the funny side. Eileen later wrote that the Queen was very interested to see who these gals were consorting with her elder daughter, and the King was absolutely charming. The visit was filmed at length and became a very effective piece of wartime propaganda. For most ordinary people at that time, the King and Queen had become powerful symbols of the kind of country that they were fighting for. So when their daughter, Princess Elizabeth, was seen amongst them, mucking in, getting her hands dirty, it must have sent a really powerful message. When the Nazis finally threw in the towel, victory in Europe was celebrated with a party to end all parties. Eileen and the other women of the ATS let rip outside Buckingham Palace. And even Princess Elizabeth snuck out incognito to gatecrash the party. Four years before those joyful celebrations, it had only been that bit of muddy water we call the English Channel that held the Nazi foe at bay. But some rather unlucky Brits didn't even have that. It's easy to forget that over 60,000 British people lived under Nazi control here in the Channel Islands. From June 1940 all the way through to 1945. The German invaders were excited to have claimed a little piece of Britain. I suppose that for them, compared to fighting, say, on the Russian front, Hello, sunshine, hello, sky. It was almost a holiday. Hello, white clouds floating by. But not so for the locals. Just keep walking. There may not have been any fighting, but the very feeling of being British and any connection with Britain was under attack. Can you imagine what life would have been like here during the German occupation? Wouldn't have been a lot of happy, smiling faces, I can tell you that. One ordinary Briton, Hubert Lanyon, was the only baker on the small island of Sark, just off Guernsey. He lived there with his wife and four kids, including five-year-old Maisie. Well, I just remembered um, being told, oh, the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming, and then when they arrived, uh, they marched 
and they used to sing beautiful songs and it, it just echoed all around the island. It was, it was really lovely to hear them singing. And of course, we were a bit apprehensive, but once we got to know them, and the ordinary soldier was quite friendly. But for Hubert, the new regime changed everything overnight. He even had to share his baker's oven with the Germans. They had half the week and he had half the week. And as war went on, it, it, the provisions came from France. The flour was a terrible quality. It was full of bits of wood, stones and rat droppings. To make things worse, the departing British army had taken a lot of the Channel Islands food supplies with it, and there wasn't much left. We could manage to grow vegetables, which was, a, you know, a saving grace. We didn't have meat, we didn't have much meat, just rabbit. But uh, whatever animal was killed had to be shared with the Germans. The Germans had their proportion and there was so much left for the islanders. Yeah. So the local people started to think outside the box and go in search of new culinary experiences. Yummy! The beach was awash with seaweed, which they harvested and boiled up to make jelly. It wasn't too bad if it was flavoured with blackberries or, frankly, anything they could lay their hands on. As time went by, the food shortages got worse and worse. The fishermen were only allowed to go about a mile out to sea because the Germans were frightened that they would run away. Basic commodities like soap began to disappear off the shelves. What little there was was reserved for newborn babies. Moss replaced cotton wool in the hospitals. Some people said they couldn't recognise their friends and colleagues in the street because they'd grown so thin. Even the Germans were hungry. When it came towards the end of the war, they shot cats, they ate cats. The Germans? Yes, uh, we saw them go up the, the lane with our cats strung on their belt. You're kidding! Our cat was on his belt, they, they'd shot it. That must have be, been awful for it, a little girl to terrible, see that. Terrible, terrible. Maisie's father, Hubert, decided to make a stand. In June 1942, the Germans had confiscated the radios on the island. And now people couldn't even get the news. So Hubert joined a secret organisation defiantly named Guns. The Guernsey Underground News Service. Because it was all so secret, no one knew very much about it. But... This building is now the Prio Library, and it's here that I reckon I'm going to find the evidence I need about what Maisie's dad was doing in the war. Historian Jilly Carr has found some of the news sheets that the resistance group published. Oh, look, that's V for Victory. Guns and V for Victory. These are original copies. Yeah. And as you can see, they're, they're typed out on tomato packing paper, which is really thin. And if you were caught with one of these, you would have been arrested? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. So what was it that Maisie's dad actually did on this newspaper? He was the distributor of guns in yeah. Sarg. He had a little library at the back of the bakery. And so he would take a newsletter and put it inside a book in the library so people would come along and browse in the library and, you know. Yeah, but apparently there were even German soldiers who knew about it but stayed silent because they also wanted to have the real news. But not everyone could be trusted to keep a secret. Some islanders were prepared to trade information for food even at the risk of having their houses daubed with the swastika. One day, acting on a tip-off, the Germans came to the Lanyon's house, searching for Hubert and his newsletters. They had fixed bayonets and they went through the toy basket under the bed, wicker toy basket, and it went right through my panda bear's stomach. That's outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't long before they found her dad. They beat him up and knocked teeth out and, and he, was, he was unconscious for a while and then they hauled him off, hands behind his back and holding his hair and pulling. And he went past our door with yeah. all the family standing on the doorstep and he just looked at us and I thought, I suppose he thought, well, when will I ever see them again? Can you remember what you were thinking? Well, I just thought, 
they were being cruel to my daddy. Was your mum able to explain to you what was going on? She didn't know where he was for a month. We, we thought he'd been taken to concentration camp and perhaps shot. Then the family discovered Hubert was alive and in prison on the island. Maisie's mum pleaded for his release, saying that the islanders were desperate for him to bake bread. After four months in prison, he was released. But five others involved in the free paper were deported to Germany, where two of them died in prison. I consider my father was lucky to come home to us. Sure. And, and I do still feel very sorry for the people whose lives were lost. Of course, there's no doubt that Hubert was a very brave man, but it does make me wonder what I would have done in a similar situation. Would I have resisted knowing that it could put my family and my neighbours in jeopardy, or would I just have gone about my business and kept my head down till the end of the war? I really don't know. In the Second World War, Victory against the Nazis depended on an event that happened far away on the other side of the world, on the peaceful Pacific islands of Hawaii. In December 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and forced the United States into the war. The cavalry had arrived. And very quickly, our little island was swarming with Americans. One and a half million of them were either stationed here or stopped off here on their way to Germany. This development had a decisive impact on the course of the war and meant a heck of a lot to the Brits who worked with them, fought with them, or, as was often the case, fell in love with the American GIs. Joy Beaver would be one of them. But back in 1941, before the GIs arrived, she was just 16, and a love affair was the last thing on her mind. Joy soon became her family's only wage earner and had to support her mother and two younger brothers. She catched the train before half seven each day when it was cheaper. But instead of leaves or snow on the line, there was the threat of blown up bridges or unexploded shells. She had a boring job at the Inland Revenue in the city, typing letters to people who hadn't paid their tax. Joy lived for her daily break. Best time of day was the lunch hour, and I could walk in the gardens of the Tower of London. At the end of each day, She'd catch the train home before night fell and the bombing started once again. Supper could be an omelette made from powdered egg, or if there was nothing else available, there was the sinister threat of whale meat. In the evenings, they'd listen to jazz or popular songs on the record player. Or tune into Winston Churchill for a bit of courage. We will meet out to the Germans more than the measure. They have meted out to us. At weekends, Joy and her friends glammed up and hit the dance hall, the Embassy Ballroom in Bexley, newly reopened after the worst of the Blitz. It's really a nice place. It was a big dance hall and uh, had a nice band. And... It was also a popular haunt for American GIs. And, of course, that drew a lot of girls that wanted to come there and dance with the soldiers. But these American boys were supposed to be on their best behaviour. Just look at this. This is the little book they all had to read instructions for American servicemen in Britain 1942 issued by the US War Department. The purpose of this guide is to start getting you acquainted with the British, their country and their ways. It goes on to give lots of handy advice. The British are often more reserved in conduct than we. 
So, if Britons sit in trains or buses without striking up conversation with you, it doesn't mean they're being haughty and unfriendly. Probably they're paying more attention to you than you think. But they don't speak to you because they don't want to appear intrusive or rude. And there's another one here. I really like this. Keep out of arguments. You can rub a Britisher the wrong way by telling him, we came over and won the last one. <laughs> I don't think they'd like that. And most importantly, don't be a show-off. The British Tommy is apt to be specially touchy about the difference between his wages and yours. Keep this in mind. Actually, the British Tommy was most likely to be worried about the thought of a GI running off with his wife or the girl next door. And to be quite honest, he was probably right to be. As one British comedian famously put it, the Yanks were oversexed, overpaid and over here. But the GI that Joy met in September 1944 wasn't like that at all. How did you first meet Carl? He was brought to the embassy ballroom by the other guys in the unit. They said, well, you, you should come and meet this girl. His name was Carl Beebe. He was not so laughing and joking and all that kind of thing like the others were. You know, he didn't tell me that the streets of New York were paved with gold. <laughs> Carl was stationed here at the stately home Hall Place, two miles from Joy's house. He worked for US Army Intelligence, intercepting encoded messages from Nazi High Command. Soon, Carl asked Joy out, and they hit it off. They'd go for walks in the park near where she lived. He was always bringing me flowers or something. For Easter, he picked a whole bunch of daffodils. There's a place where flowers grow. After three months of courting, Carl proposed. But arranging a wedding in wartime required, let's say, special skills. How did you get a dress this nice in the middle of the war? You'd have to ask my brother. How he got it through some friends of his or people he knows, I don't know. So you're saying it was off the black market, really, aren't you? I believe that it was the black market, yes. Did you get married in a church? Yes, I did. A very much damaged church. The roof was out and uh, the rain and the snow was coming through. Um, they'd add little pots on the floor to catch the water and you could hear the water dinging into the pots. The Second World War had brought Joy and Carl together and they eventually made the journey to America together with their young son. The war created huge rifts between countries, which took decades to heal. So it's nice to hear some stories of romance coming out of all that chaos. For Joy, at least, and for others like her, the war did have a silver lining. The Second World War was the People's War. And for many Britons, its triumphant end remains one of our country's finest hours. <laughs>